So um, I work for New Relic. This is what we look like. Um, we do performance monitoring and analytics. If you have questions, talk to me. Or if you're from New Relic, raise your hand. Talk to any of us, because we can help you out. Um, and yeah, and Brian, you get to raise your hand too, because you know enough to talk about it. Um, so uh, we just tell you what your software does in real time in production, which is a fantastic skill to have, because most people actually don't have that. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, so I work at New Relic. Uh, I'm a software engineer. I'm, I'm mostly front end focused. Um, and over the years, I've kind of grown up with the organization. And now I'm, in, I'm a software architect. Um, but what's interesting is I'm, I'm very self-taught. So many of you here are coming to us um, through code schools. And that's an advantage I did not have. So you can go very far with very little education in this field. Um, but uh, the more interesting bit is I trained as a biologist. This is what my office used to look like. Um, and, and now the view from my office looks like this. And you can see it. You know, here's what it looks like during the day. You can see what it looks like at night. Um, and um, if you've used New Relic in the past several years, the current design is one that I implemented. So you've seen my work. Um, the prior redesign and the one for that were also mine. So you, you've seen the dev work that I do. Um, but I, uh, let's get a little bit of info about you. Um, so how many of you are still in code school? Wow. They must have all left at the break. OK. So uh, how many of you are, are frontline engineers, as opposed to, say, managers or something else? Okay. Engineers, OK. How many of you are managers? OK, a few of you. Um, and then um, how many of you do architecture work? OK, cool. So this is going to be probably more relevant for you. But um, as the frontline engineers, you probably have some influence over how architecture gets done in your company. And so take what I'm talking about to heart and see if maybe there are ideas here that can help you improve your day-to-day -day life. And then um, how many of you work for companies with uh, 1,000 engineers? Right, like a few, OK. Um, 500 engineers? 100? Like, this is where I raise my hand. We don't have 500 yet. Um, 50? 10. 10 engineers or more? And less than 10 engineers, how many people? A lot of people in small firms. OK, so in, in smaller companies, how you do architecture really doesn't matter as much, right? Because in small companies, like, you don't need a lot of process, you don't need a lot of overhead. You know, to have a team meeting, you stand up and you're like, hey, I have an idea, and you're having a team meeting, right? Um, it, you know, here at New Relic, we have, we have what, um, 300 people in the office here in Portland, plus engineers scattered elsewhere around two continents. Um, and so for us, how we do architecture, actually, we need process and it matters. So anyway, um, so here's the plan for what we're going to talk about tonight. So we're going to talk about armchairs, architecture, and evolution, and then kind of the wrap up and the lessons. So let's talk about armchairs. Um, you're probably wondering why we're talking about armchairs. It will become clear. So uh, typically, um, when you're an engineer and you're at a company that's a little bit bigger and you have an architectural process, you're like, okay, I've got a problem to solve. Let's, let's do some architecture first. And so you kind of think about it this way, right? This is the, this phrase that's frequently attributed to Longfellow. Um, Longfellow ripped it off of an old Chinese proverb. So it's not Longfellow. It's an old Chinese proverb. Like so many things, the Chinese were there first. And um, in, we, we think of this as, um, Go consult the wise man, right? Like, go talk to the architect, the guru. And, and the interesting thing about this phrase, and the reason I put it up here, is Longfellow puts it up here to say, you know, if I go talk to the wise man, I, it is so much, it's so much better than anything I could do on my own. It's like 10 years of study on my own. And the Chinese phrase literally means that, but the way it's used in the Chinese cultural context is that if I come to you, and you're an important scholar, you know, you're an important person, I come to you and I take some of your time, at the end of the conversation, I will say this to flatter you as thanking you for your time. But I don't actually mean it literally, right? So it totally, totally gets abused in the, in the Western cultural context. But anyway, so, so back to the problem at hand. You're an engineer. You've got a problem to solve. So you want to go and you consult the wise man. And this is what it looks like. And frequently in our industry, it's, it's a wise man. And that's really sad. And I wish we could fix that faster than we're working on it. But we're trying to make that better. And what the wise man tells you is, you know, Write this code. And this is kind of the worst case scenario. And as an engineer, this is, this is like, this is terrible, right? Because you've gone to a person to get their advice on a problem, and they've told you, here is the exact work that you need to do. They just took away all your ability to do anything creative. And what we do fundamentally is a very creative 
kind of work. Writing software is literally creating things. Um, and so in, in the best case scenario, you, you get this out of your architect. And this is, what the details don't matter here. I looked this off of Wikipedia. Um, and uh, when you get a situation like this, like this is better than having an architect tell you write this exact code. But it's still not fantastic because it can be very hard to interpret. And the exact boundaries, like what goes in which box, what are the protocols, and all of those hundred little details aren't really resolved here. So the architect in this case maybe has given you some clarity and some vision, but they haven't really solved the problem yet. And that's kind of, I think, part of what's wrong with the, the approaches you get with traditional architecture work, is that as a frontline engineer, you just, you just don't want either of these answers. It, they take away your autonomy. They, they take away your skills and your intelligence. They just don't recognize you and the things that you have to contribute. Uh, I find it very infantilizing, actually. Uh, as a frontline engineer to get either of those answers. Because you go and you look for advice and you get treated like somebody who doesn't know any better. But that's not true. Like, you know better. You work in the code. The architects frequently don't. And so when I say that, you know, the engineers don't want this, this comes from experience. At New Relic, we, we know this because we tried this and it just failed miserably. For a while, we had an architecture process where you go and you consult the architect and he would tell you what to build. And what happened was that um, the engineers hated it. And so they started not talking to the architect. <laughs> they would go and work around them. They'd build the thing and then say, oh, should I have asked for permission? Oh, sorry. It's built on my deadlines next week, so YOLO, right? Let's ship this. <laughs> um, and and you know, there's, a, there's a real problem there. In a company of 10 people, you can get away with that. Um, when you have 300 engineers, you can't get away with that anymore because you can cause real problems. And this is what we really find is that when you when you're have that kind of architectural process, you're really balancing engineering autonomy versus technical debt. And the engineers that we have here at New Relic are really good engineers. And so when we have these teams that are not talking to the architect and they're going and working on their own, because they're good engineers, they're making good decisions for themselves and for their project. But they're not making good decisions for the system as a whole and for the architecture overall and for the company. And so you really trade off the engineer autonomy for the technical debt that you accrue in the system overall. And, and you know, early on in your startup career, if those of you who work at small companies, if you're early phase startups, you take on a lot of technical debt. You do it very consciously, and that's a good thing. Taking on that technical debt allows you to move very fast to get your market fit, to get your customers, to start making money, which is what you need to do to get a paycheck to survive. But when you're bigger, that technical debt becomes very expensive to maintain. You spend a lot of your engineering cycles taking care of the debt rather than innovating. And that's what kills bigger companies, right? That's what leads you to be prone to disruption by the little company that can take on that debt that you can't afford anymore. So um, this trade-off is, is a hard problem. And so what we found is that our engineers were working alone without the architecture oversight, we're adding a lot of technical debt to our system. And so this is a trade-off that people recognize, maybe not consciously, but people are aware of this. And so a lot of companies, they have a solution. Lock it down. And so you take all of the decision-making ability away from the engineers. Only the architects get to make the decisions. And then you don't have this problem where the engineers are making decisions that don't work for the system overall, where they create local technical debt. Well, there's a problem with this solution. Um, if you do that, you, you look like this. This is a bank. It's a bank that is masquerading very unconvincingly as a Greek temple. <laughs> when was the last classical Greek temple raised? I think it was more than 2,000 years ago. Ballpark. So why are they trying to look like a Greek temple, right? Like this makes sense for a banking institution because they're trying to look like they're a stable place to put your money. But banks, like all companies now, are software companies. As a software company, you can't do it like you did it 2,000 years ago. It just doesn't work. And so banks are famous for this kind of lock it down approach. And now banks have a hard time because they're trying to hire COBOL and Fortran programmers. And those people don't exist anymore. And because they locked down their architecture, they made it resistant to change. And the world around them evolved. The world around them changed. 
and they didn't change with it. And now they cannot find COBOL and Fortran programmers to save their lives. So I have to hire engineers who are willing to become COBOL and Fortran programmers. How many people in this room want to learn COBOL or Fortran? Exactly, right? And so you can see the problem that these banks are having is nobody wants to do that. So they're having real serious problems right now. Ripe for disruption. Um, anyway, uh, your next startup might be a banking startup. I encourage you to do that. I have no interest in getting an industry that regulated. So um, in the end, uh, what we have is it's actually not a two-way trade-off between engineering, uh, engineer autonomy and technical debt in your system. It's a three-way trade-off. There's engineering autonomy and happiness, and so I call that engineers here. And then there's technical debt, but there's also flexibility. You have to have an architecture that can evolve with the times. You cannot become a bank where you lock it down and cease to change. And so I think that architecture is really balancing these three things. You have to create a system that makes the engineers happy, that doesn't accumulate too much technical debt, and that can change with time. Change over time, it's called evolution. Part two of the talk, architecture and evolution. Um, so I chose this photo very uh, carefully. Um, this is uh, the, the uh, ceiling in the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, Gaudí's Cathedral. It's still under construction. You can see over here there's some construction work. This, this side is the, the glory facade, they call it. This is the main entrance. It is not yet built. Um, and I, I chose this image because uh, Gaudí was very strongly inspired by biology. And so you can see here at the bottom, at the top of the photo, these round, these uh, oval bosses, those are the column capitals. So the columns that hold up the roof, they rise to the capital, and then at the capital they split into branches like trees. And in fact, the shapes here, these round shapes, come from the shapes of the scars that you get on sycamore trees when you trim big branches off to make them into street trees. So we have sycamore trees, they're also called plane trees, they're all over the city here in Portland. You will see this shape if you go looking around the city, it's everywhere. Um, and so he was inspired by nature. And um, we do a lot of our biology kind of, or a lot of our architecture the way that biology kind of works. And so I was very inspired by this. So that's why I'm showing you this photo tonight. Um, so let's do a basic review of biology. So um, it's kind of high school bio maybe, maybe freshman year college bio. So um, this is a, an evolutionary tree, so time moves down. And so at the top you've got an ancestral species and then there's some kind of split. So maybe there's two populations and they, they, they move to different places. The world changes, a mountain range comes up, a river goes through there and they get separated. And then over time one of those populations through the process of mutation, which is a natural thing, um, it acquires some mutations. Now, um, all of us have unique mutations. In fact, you can run the statistics on this. And on average, every person in this room, in fact, every human being on the planet, has five mutations that are unique to them. We have hundreds of mutations that we acquired that our parents do not have. But most of those, other humans also have. But statistically, each one of us has five unique mutations. That's kind of interesting, right? Five? Well, there's seven billion people on the planet. Like, think about that, right? Five mutations, seven billion people. It's kind of cool. Um, and so um, uh, what humans do is we come in, we look at the species, and we see, okay, there's mutations that are going on. And those mutations, some of them don't do anything. Some of them actually change the phenotype. They change how the organisms look, how they behave. And after a while, we look at them as humans. We say, well, this is a different species now. We'll call it a child species, not the ancestral species. On the other side of the branch, the other population is also acquiring mutations, but they're going to be different mutations. And most of those mutations, as they arise, they then disappear in the next generation. They're not passed on. Some are retained and they get fixed. Maybe there's another split. We get some more mutation going on and we can look at, uh, and as humans, we're here in the, at, at the present time. We can look across the system and say, we now have three species. We can infer that they were related and infer what the ancestral species looked like. So here's the, the key concepts here. First is that mutations accumulate. This is just a thing that happens. Um, it's a byproduct of how we copy ourselves. Um, those mutations change the populations. So you can, you can see what the mutations are doing. And then the third part is that the environment is always changing. Mutation is a very important process because the environment is always changing. And if we had no mutations, we would all still be single-celled organisms. <laughs> right? And having mutations allows us to stay on top of the changing environment. 
the climate that we have now and, and disregarding human, you know, anthropogenic or human caused climate change, which is a big issue. The climate that we have now is very different than the climate that we had 500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, and 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago, we were in an ice age. There's a natural cycle, ice ages happen. There's going to be another one at some point in the future. I will probably not be alive to see it, neither will you. Um, but these things happen. In the 1400s, you could grow wine in Britain, good wine in England. England is not renowned for its sun. You need sun for good wine. England grows wine now, it's not very good. It was better 500 years ago because we're in the middle of a warm period that has since disappeared. Um, and so the, the, the environment is always evolving. The mutations allow the populations of species to try out a bunch of different stuff. So I might have a mutation that lets me prosper in cold weather. Well, if the weather changes to be cold, my lineage will do well. If the weather changes to be warm, my lineage is going to die out. But maybe, you know, Kristen's lineage is going to have a mutation that lets her do well in warm weather. Hers will prosper, whereas mine will fail. So that mutational process gives you the variation that you need to make decisions about what's going to survive. And in an evolutionary system, those decisions are not made consciously, right? Natural selection is not run by anything. It's just, what is the environment today? Who are the organisms who succeed? That's what happens. Well, in, in architecture, we can make decisions. So here's, here's that same chart as before, but look, looked at a little bit differently. So now, rather than being humans looking at the end result, we're humans looking at the beginning of the result. Our system now. And this is the architectural system, the software system that we've built. And so in this view, each node is not a place where the population split. It's a major decision that we could make. So for example, we could choose, let's introduce Ruby into our stack. We could choose, let's remove Ruby from our stack. We could choose, let's write in Java. We could choose things like, let's use an enterprise message bus. And we could choose, Functional programming is our new paradigm. And so all of these choices give us essentially a decision tree. And so we can look at all the decisions that we might make over time and infer what is the state of our system going to be in the future. We have three possibilities in, in this particular chart. And so we can make those big decisions, those are these nodes, and then over time we get mutations. But what are mutations really in the, art, in the software sense? That's frontline engineers working on the code making a bunch of small changes. And those little changes that you make over time prevent the system from changing in certain ways, make it easier to change in others. And this is kind of like what mutation does in, in the wild. And so as architects, the question we really have is, which of these possibilities do we want in the future? And so the way to look at this is, that's our system now and our system in the future. And that's the path we're going to take to get there. So one way to rephrase this is, how do we get from here to there? And the answer is process, right? Architectural process. It's always about process. Um, and so let's talk about our process. But first, let's remind you some of the goals, right? We have this three-way trade-off. We want to balance these three things. And we have one major constraint, at least here at New Relic. Um, this is a photo of the engineers from our annual offsite, which was this July. So this is us in July. There's more of us now. And, and these are the architects. See, that's me. Um, and actually, it's not quite the architects because Jason is now an architect as of last week. And uh, I didn't adjust this. And I went to look for his face in here, and I couldn't find where he was. So if you know where you are in this photo, tell me, and I can adjust the slide. Um, and so um, with only five architects and this many engineers, you can see we got a lot of problems, right? Like we got to do a lot of work to get the system to move. So that's the biggest constraint on our process. So let's talk about what we do in our process that enables the five architects to get 300 engineers to balance the engineering happiness and autonomy, the technical debt, and the flexibility of the system. So here's how we organize teams. Um, so first, we have assigned architects for each team. So your team, you've got one architect. Actually, you have two, but you have an architect. You know who to go to to ask questions of. This is really helpful because it gives that architect the context for what that team is doing. You get a close bond. And if you, you're the engineer and you go to the architect, you don't have to explain what's going on. They know, right? So they have context. That's really helpful. Um, and then second, we have what we call an anchor engineer on every team. Um, anchor engineer is not a term that means anything outside of New Relic. Um, and the anchor is really just a, a fancy term for kind of a technical lead. 
Um, and they have a couple of duties. Um, primarily, their, their, their main responsibility is to facilitate communication between the architect and the team. So anytime there's anything going on in architecture land that they think their team should know about, they tell the team. Anytime their team is doing anything irrelevant to the architects, they tell the architect. That's their primary job. So we have a close point of contact that goes two ways, right? There's the, the anchor and the architect, and they can work closely together. Um, third thing we do is every quarter, the architect has this kind of state of the world meeting with every team. And um, I have 18 teams that I work with. <laughs> um, we have five architects, a lot of a lot of engineers. Um, and so this ends up being a, a, a big amount of work. But every quarter, we, we sit down, we have a meeting where the, there's no real like decision-making goal. The goal of the meeting is, how do you feel about the architecture that you own? Because every quarter, three months go by, you learn stuff about what your system is doing. You know, we scale, we get new customers, we have more data coming in. Maybe this thing that was working three months ago isn't working so well anymore. And so we have this regular check-in cadence to figure out how the engineers feel about the architecture. And the architects also may have feelings about this. We may be like, you know, we're looking at our like, outage logs, and that thing is having lots of problems, and we should probably fix that. Um, and so it's kind of a two-way check-in where everybody can see how do we feel about the state of the system right now. Um, in terms of how we organize projects, um, the architects are technical product managers. This is really very important because um, we have a product management organization. And product managers don't get graded on the architecture of the system that their engineers are building. They get graded on how many features do they ship to customers, how much revenue are they pulling in. Well, if you only do that, you acquire a tremendous amount of technical debt and you never clean it up. And so by making the architects product managers for the technical side of the problem, we can influence the roadmap. We can say, you know, that, that piece of the system, that's really trash. We've got to fix that. Let's put that on the roadmap and fix it next quarter. So we can get time allocated for doing that kind of maintenance work that you need to do to keep the system moving. Um, and we also are continuously engaged with our projects. And this is very important. A lot of companies, um, the traditional architecture model is you, know, you go talk to the architects and they tell you what to build and then you're done, right? Like that's the interaction, you go build it. Some companies, you, you go talk to the architects and you come with the plan of what you want to build and they throw stones at it until they're happy that you've suffered enough and then you go build it. Um, and neither of those models is particularly helpful because what happens is at the beginning of the project, you think you know what you want to build and then you start building it and you learn stuff. And halfway through, you realize that what you want to build isn't going to work and so you change your plan. Well, if you've already talked to architecture and you've checked that box, right, it doesn't really work so good. So um, we have this very continuous engagement model where we talk to the engineers at the beginning of the project, we talk to them in the middle, we talk to them at the end, we talk to them anytime they need it. We talk to them if we get a sense that they might need our help and we just check in. And that means that over the lifetime of the project, we're helping them steer the architecture that they're building to something that makes a lot of sense. So in the middle of the project, if they have a crisis, doesn't matter. We can change course and it's fine. Everybody's on board with it. The third piece of how we organize the architecture here at New Relic is that we try and be very public and very transparent in how we do work. Um, first, we have a public record of all decisions. All architectural decisions have a URL, a stable URL. And that can take a lot of forms. Um, so we have an architecture um, write-ups mailing list. We use Google Groups. Every thread has a stable URL. So that means we can send out a thing and there's a stable URL for it. But what's interesting about that is it means that the decisions are all public and searchable. Um, that's very important. Um, second, we have this, uh, well, okay, actually before I get there. Um, not only do you have the record of decisions, but most of the decisions don't happen by an architect just saying, we're going to do X, ship it, right? That's this kind of guru model that doesn't work so well. Um, a lot of our decisions happen in what we call architecture notes. So um, here's a, a screenshot of a note. Um, we use um, GitHub pages and Jekyll, you know, serve a static site. And so um, what we do is uh, when we're trying to make decisions, we draw up a document and we open a pull request. And the pull request is just for this markdown file that produces this text, right? And, and they all have a very similar form. There's this kind of like organizational section about here's the vision, here's why we think these things are important. And then we get into the, the normative content, the shoulds and the musts. 
And it follows a very kind of RFC style language, which I don't particularly enjoy, but seems to be effective. Um, and uh, um, because it's a pull request, anybody can come in and comment. So we can get all the engineers in the organization, and thankfully not all of them participate because that would be just chaos, but we can get all the people who care about packaging code for NPM, so all of our front end JS people, can come in and say, you know what, this thing that you say about how we should not use peer dependencies, I don't agree with that. And we can have a debate. And if it gets out of hand in the pull request, we, we do it in person. We like, okay, there's too many people in here, let's just have a meeting. We have the meeting and then somebody will go and put those results back into the PR. Um, but the, the nice net result of that is that all of our decisions have this public debate component. And each of these notes at the bottom link back to the original PR. So you can see the note, you can see the rules, and you can see how we got there. What is the process that we used to get to those rules? Why is it that we did this thing in this rule that just doesn't make much sense? Oh, well, there's a caveat. There's a reason why we did that. There's something else stupid in our architecture that we're compensating for. And that's why we have this rule that doesn't make any sense. It makes sense when you know the backstory. And so we make sure everybody has access to that backstory. And having that history is really important because it trains engineers to make better architectural decisions for themselves in the future. So we have this public record of decisions and this public decision making in the form of these pull requests. And here's what the pull request list looks like. And this is a model that we pioneered here at New Relic, not for architecture decisions, but for managerial process. And so this, this guy is Ralph Bodener. He was my boss here for a while. Um, he's a great guy. He did a talk link. Um, to the slides uh, about how we use pull requests to manage process and culture. So all of the managerial process is also done through pull requests. So as an engineer, not a manager, I can go and comment on the process changes that the managers want to make. It's fantastic. It gives me say and input into the system. Um, so if you're curious about this model, you can go look at his talk. He kind of explains it in more detail than, than I've done here. Um, so the, the last part about being public and transparent is that we have daily office hours. Um, and this is a thing that we experimented with um, early on in our growth. Um, some teams that were very high in demand would have office hours as a way to corral the interruptions they were getting. Um, and it turns out it's very successful. People really like this. They like knowing that every day between 11 and 12, I can go to that desk and the architects will be there to answer questions for me. So this is actually what the architecture office hours look like. And, and here's some key points. So first, there, there's an architect there. That's me. And I'm smiling. That's very important. right? You want people to come talk to you. Got to be smiling. Um, there's a computer there right? Not so that A, I can do stuff if there's no customers. Uh, but B, so that remote people can also engage in office hours. You don't have to be in Portland to do it. Um, we have a whiteboard. You can see that on, on the left side of the screen there. Or, right side of the screen there. Um, and that's actually a nice double whiteboard, slides up and down, it's really fancy. Um, so we can diagram stuff out and talk about things. And the fourth part of this that's really important, that's very subtle, is that it's not in a meeting room. This is out in the open. Anybody walking by can listen in and join the conversation. This is a big part of that public and transparent decision making. We're not doing it in a back room with cigars. I'm doing it here in open. You can come and listen all you want to. And so what we have is we have a lot of really ad hoc kind of interactions. So two people will independently come to office hours, and somebody will arrive first, and I'll start getting into this conversation about something that they're building. And the second person shows up. They're, talking, they're here to talk about a totally different problem. But they join the conversation for the first one. And then the first person sticks around and has the conversation with the second person about their problem. And so we get a lot of these very kind of ad hoc interactions among the engineers, and that really contributes to this openness. And it, what it does is it makes the engineers really feel like they're a part of the process because they are a part of the process. They have a lot of sway. So um, we haven't talked about mutation yet. Um, the last part of our process is that we encourage mutation. So far, all I've described is kind of how I make decisions. But that sounds a lot like locking it down, right? And that's not the system that we want. We don't want a system that's going to be stagnant over time. We want to have experiments. And so we have a process that we came up with and did through this PR kind of system to encourage experimentation. And so what it is is that any team can come to us and say, 
you know, you've got all these rules in the notes. I want to break the rules. Here's how I want to break the rules and here's why I want to break them. And we look at that proposal and say, okay, you want to break the rules? Sure. So one of the experiments we had recently, somebody wanted to start using Go. Primarily we're Ruby and Java at New Relic. That's where our expertise lies. Somebody wanted to use Golang. Well, Go's pretty interesting. It's got a lot of stuff going for it. it it's got all of the concurrency benefits that Java has, but doesn't have garbage collection. So yay, right? Um, but um, we don't use it a lot. We don't have a lot of expertise. We're not great at standing it up in production at the scale that we have to run it at yet. So it's risky for us to start using it. So this team comes to us to say, we want to use Go. And we say, OK, so what's the problem you're trying to solve? And why is Go a good fit for this problem? So they have to convince us of that. And that's actually not very hard. And then we work with that team to come up with how are we going to measure the success of the experiment? How do we know that Go is successful? Well, um, can it scale? That's a question that we might have. So we put in stuff to measure about what's the throughput the app can handle, how are you going to test that, you know, what's your load testing strategy, you're going to siege it, whatever that is. Um, but because not everybody's familiar with Go, one of the other things that this team came up with is let's get a read from the engineers on the project how easy it was for them to spin up using Go from zero. And it turns out that all the engineers on this team, after a week, they were like, we love Go, it's amazing. We're competent, we're writing code, and it's fantastic. And so we had a very successful experiment around using Go because it scaled really well, the code was easy to write, the footprint was very small, and the engineers were very happy with how it felt as a language to use. And so that was great. So we, we, we like took our little score sheet and we said, Go, okay, one point. It doesn't mean Go is an accepted part of the stack yet. Another team is going to have to come with us and say, hey, we want to use Go. Well, the second experiment is going to be easier than the first. And the third will be easier than the second, and so on. And after a while, we're going to say, you know what? We've done a lot of Go. We have the expertise that we need internally. It's now an accepted part of our stack. You want to use Go, you don't have to ask us anymore. Take it as a given. And so we're going to get there. Right? We've got a few more experiments in Go that are in process. And I think within six months, Go will be a part of our stack permanently here. And so we have this process for experimentation that introduces new ideas. Let's try Go and see if it works. Maybe Go doesn't work. Well, we throw it out. And what does that look like if you're the team that just spent all that time working on the Go project? Well, part of the contract with the experiment is you're taking on the schedule risk that if the experiment fails, meaning you get I mean it's successful but with a negative answer, right? Um, if you get the negative answer, negative result from your experiment, you're committing to rewriting that thing to be compliant with the rules that we have. And so people are a little bit conservative about what they propose for experiments, but we really encourage them to propose experiments that are very, very small. So that the cost of experimentation is low, so that they have to rewrite it, it's cheap. It takes them a few weeks. And so far we've been successful. Not all of our experiments have had positive outcomes. That's what we want. We want most of them, but not all of them, to be positive. If all of them are positive, we're not doing enough experiments. If all of them are negative, we're really bad at deciding what to play with. So we want something in the middle, right? Um, and so far, the, what we've seen is that it seems to be working. Um, we want to say yes to the experiments. We do say yes to the experiments. The engineers have gotten that, and they're, they're talking to us about it. And the way this fits in the system overall is that you know, we conduct these experiments, and over time, like with this Go example, we decide Golang is now part of the stack. So we change our, our published notes. We change the published decisions. So we've changed the requirements for building software in our system. And then, as technical product managers, the architects can say, OK, well, we have a new rule here. And this part of the stack is not really compliant with the new rule. And that's going to be a problem for us. Let's spend some time and fix that. So we can allocate time on the roadmap for those non-compliant parts of the stack to become compliant parts of the stack. And so that means that we change the system. And as we change the system, we learn things. And as we learn things and the world moves on, we get ideas for new experiments. And we kind of cycle. And this is how we keep the architecture evolving over time while balancing the engineer autonomy. They tell us what the experiments are. They tell us what the architecture should be and the technical debt. We tell them if it's reasonable or not. Um, and so in the end, we have this very nice kind of interaction between the architecture team and the engineers that keeps everybody happy and keeps the system evolving. And this is why I think New Relic is one of the best places to be an engineer. That's why I'm really happy here as an engineer. So to look at the parts of the process, here's kind of the most important bits. Um, 
And I want to call something out to you. These items that I've bolded, these are all about engagement between the architects and the engineers. So clearly, the most important work that I do as an architect is engaging with the teams. It's engaging with the engineers. The most important work that I do is not drawing the diagrams with the boxes and the arrows. I do some of that. But the biggest part of my work is talking to people. And that is, I think, what makes the model successful for us, is it's that personal engagement. Getting the engineers to talk to us, getting them to understand the problems that we're trying to solve, and understanding the problems that they're trying to solve, so we can all work together to make the system better for everyone. Engagement is number one. All right, so part three of the talk. What have we learned? Um, so here's kind of the take home for doing better architecture where you work. First, you want to empower the engineers. Um, the, the phrase that I use most often in architectural conversations is, my job is not to tell you what the architecture should be. Your job is to tell me. I have to, we have to empower the engineers to make those decisions. We have to vet them for sanity and provide the system-wide context so that they don't accumulate too much technical debt in their area of the stack. But we have to get them to propose stuff for us. Um, so it's about empowerment and engagement. We have to be public. You have to make everything very clear and very transparent so people can see how decisions get made, so they can feel like they can have influence and can have ownership over the parts of the system that they build. You have to be flexible. Change happens. I mean, at, how old is Ruby now? 20 years old? 20? Ruby feels like the new kid on the block. It's not the new kid on the block. It's old. New kids on the block, Golang, Elixir, JavaScript. It's old, but actually re just recently became a real language that was able to be used in production, you know? <laughs> um, and I say this as a front-end engineer, right? Believe me. Um, and, and so the world is always changing. So you have to be flexible. You have to be willing to adapt with it. That lock it down response just does not serve anybody over the long term. And the last part is because in, in engagement is number one, you've got to be ready to talk. You've got to be ready to talk a lot. You talk to people in person, you talk to them over email, you talk to them in documentation. I spend my life talking to people. I like talking. It works for me. <laughs> if you don't like talking and you're an architect, this model probably won't work for you. Um, but there's a lot of parts of this model that may work very well for your organization. Um, and one of the things that we do around this, this being flexible, I, I, just, I have a little note in here, I have to, I have to put this out, is we, we, don't, um, we don't always follow best practices. Because if everybody followed best practices, we wouldn't figure out the next best practices. And we'd still be stuck writing COBOL and Fortran. And so you have to be willing to like, try stuff out and like, be a little bit bold and be uncomfortable. You have to try stuff you don't like, like Node. Like you just have to do that, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, so, and in the end, you, know, you, learn it, you learn what it's good at, and you realize there's, there's a real purpose there. So, um, ignore some best practices, not all of them, a lot of them are good and useful, but ignore some of them. And so, you know, our processes evolve. So this process that I've described to you tonight has come about through months of experimentation on the process itself, public decision making about the process, shopping that process around to people, getting buy-in and so on. And this is again that link to Ralph's talk about how we do this with respect to engineering management process. Um, we're always trying out new stuff and throwing out old stuff. You know, process has to evolve. The company changes. When I joined, the office fit into a quarter of this room. There were seven people in it. There's 300 people in this office now. Uh, the processes we had then just clearly can't work now. You've got to be willing to change as, as you grow. Um, and so, so that's it. That, that's the message. You know, engage, be flexible, change the process. So that's it. Um, if you have any questions, I'll take them. Yeah. What, uh, if, if you can speak to this, what uh, failures had, uh, had you going forward? And how did you, in the experimentations, uh, how did you turn those, if you can uh, speak to this, how did you turn those into positive experiences? Um, so there's, there's only really one way that an experiment fails. An experiment fails if you get no result. That's a failed experiment. A successful experiment might be positive or negative. It might tell you the experiment gave us a thing that we want or a thing that we don't want. I guess what I meant but, in a negative context. Yeah, yeah. Something that you don't want and then you had to go back to the, the original constraints. Were you able to take lessons from that experiment and bring them into this, the existing 
Yeah, so, so always. Even a negative experiment gives you good data. Um, there's things that you know, well, why did it fail? What about it made it not work for us? And so um, recently, and I can speak from some of my experience as a front end architect, we've been experimenting up the wazoo in our front end. We do not have a stack for our front end. Every project is different right now. And we are, we've started bringing people together to kind of share what they've been doing and share the learnings. And we conducted a very unofficial set of large experiments because we just didn't have the bandwidth to try and corral people. We didn't have a process. We didn't have anything. So we're like, okay, go, go play. And I did a lot of, spent a lot of time brokering agreement on what the stack maybe could look like. Two years ago, we had this conversation. It was Angular. We had the conversation again six months ago. Now it's React. Well, guess what? We have Angular apps out there. We got React out there. We've got React done about 18 different ways. Um, and so what we do is we bring people together and we talk about it. We learn the things that work and things that don't work. And out of these conversations, we're coming up with what we think our ideal stack should be. And this is about that engagement, is I'm talking to all the UI engineers and I'm getting them to talk to each other. And I don't work in the front end very much anymore because my job is now talking to people. It's not writing code. And so I cannot speak to what using React is like on a day-to-day -day basis. But I have a company full of people who can. And so I have to leverage their expertise and get them talking and phrase the questions and frame the problem the right way so we can get good answers out of that. But even failed experiments, you learn something. And sometimes the experiment is like, well, you know, that technology is just not going to work for us. We tried with Apache Storm. It was miserable. We hate it. <laughs> I don't want to say Apache Storm is a bad technology. I can't speak to that. It failed for us miserably. It did not work for what we wanted it to do. And so what did we learn? We learned don't do Storm. Well, what did we learn about Storm that made it not suitable? Because Storm is this, uh, for those of you who don't know, Storm is a stream processing framework. So you, build, you stand up a cluster of nodes and you can do stream processing of a flow of data. And, and to give a sense for scale, at Neuralic flow of data is a big problem for us. Our data intake pipeline takes 17 million requests a minute and that doubles every nine months. So that 17 million number was from June. So it's more than that now. I mean, I, don't, I have no idea what it is. So as you imagine, stream processing is like a really big deal for us. And what we discovered is that Storm treats stream processing as a special case of batch processing. Well, they have that wrong. Batch processing is a special case of stream. It's a stream with big interruptions, <laughs> right? And so we learned that that approach to stream processing fails. So we looked at other stream processing things. We're like, oh, Apache Samza does the same mistake. Well, let's not try that. Um, and so you can always take data from experiments that had negative results. The only thing you want to avoid is a failed experiment where you get no data. So you'll always learn something. And so that, that storm piece, we tried as an experiment. We threw it out. It's gone. The team rewrote it. They did it in old school Java because we didn't have a better alternative. We're, ex we're experimenting with Flink now which is another one of these stream processing frameworks. So we'll try that out. If it works for us, we'll keep it. If not, we'll throw it out too. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm sorry, what was that? No, I've never read Flink the comic. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Uh, is it about stream processing? Oh, damn it. <laughs> I'll look it up, I'll look it up, thanks. Anything else? No, all right. Well, uh, thank you very much. If you have questions, you know, tweet at me, talk to me. I'm always here. Oh, wait, one more. Sorry, I yeah. have one question. Uh, did you mention where you can find this, or is there a way to find this? Yes. There's a bit.ly link in the bottom right-hand corner. That's the slides on speaker deck. Okay. Thank you for asking. All right. All right, that's it. So thanks, y'all. Ask me questions, and I'll see you here next month.